Black Friday. Is it two minutes wrong? No. So I think I think that would be the place to go. <laughs> Thank you so much yeah. for staying very late. Uh, so I have uh, maybe just uh, one question, and after that, I will, um, I don't know, we usually open to the question to the, from the audience, and then I hope the Alex help me the, yeah, and then, uh, <laughs> yeah, I have uh, one question is the, one question is actually that the reason I invite the interesting company and then the, also the big, biggest bank in London, because I have a question about the traditional finance and the crypto finance, what's happening right now. And then, the, for example, EOS raised the, how much, the 185 million in five days from the ICO. And then, <laughs> for the eight minutes, isn't it? And how many? 17 minutes? Yeah. Oh, Cosmos. Uh, Cosmos? No, that was like reasonable 28 minutes. 28 minutes. <laughs> 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 I get the, I mean, 17, the time it was, 17 million, more than 17 million within 17. Yeah, at the time it was like 17 minutes. Like 12, 15. 12 minutes. <laughs> no, 12, 15 million within like 17, 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Okay, so, so this is ICO right now happening. It's a very exciting. And then for me, it's a, this is part of the crypto finance, right? So I, um, I, my question is is ICO is a market bubble or becoming the new era? The start beginning of the new era. This is my question. So, what do you think? Uh, well, I think there are two parts to this answer, right? There is, I think, in the short term, it's uh, it's probably a bubble because a lot of these projects have very little actual working products or prototypes, at least, and they still raise like 150 million euros. And if you compare that to the different, like. No company should need 150 million euros just to get to market. Um, so there will be, most likely, if the token actually now represents company value, you might see a round of devaluation. Um, I think in the long term, this is an awesome way to do, uh, this is a kickstart of for companies that have network effects, right? Um, so I think in the long term, this could be well, uh, like a valid way for new companies to raise funds. You want to say something? Everybody <laughs> looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> this is the moment where I get fired. Things are changing very definitely. Um, the technology has been around in principle to do this for about 20 years. And I, I remember talking to the EU regulators and saying, we can in principle do this sort of initial offering on our laptops now already because we have digital cash now back in the 1990s. Um, what has changed this time, I think, is that Ethereum value has skyrocketed. And that value has left a lot of people in Ethereum with spare cash they weren't expecting, in a sense that the valuation is so high that they are now looking at the amount of money they've got and worrying about how to use it, how to do something. They cannot possibly spend it. So they are madly interested in diversification, which creates, if you like, a supply of value to put into these ERC-20 contracts. And therefore, yes, we are looking at a wave. We could call it a bubble, but you know that's a historical thing that we haven't quite reached yet. Uh, we are looking at a wave of increase of value moving into these different areas. Um, I think the main thing to... Um, think about is that the world has changed and cryptocurrencies have crossed into the next level. They are going to be here to stay. They do have very serious valuations and people are going to be investing in them, whatever that means, to them, to anybody else, to increase the value that is available and put money into projects that are new in ways which were not permitted or not available or too costly in the old system. So we are in a situation where perhaps we're entering this sort of um, dual channel world where we have the conventional financial system. Yes, you can do an IPO in the London markets. Or you have the cryptocurrency markets. Yes, you can go into the Wild West and try your luck. But to some extent, it's actually quite similar to the United States of America where they have uh, very big markets, the NASDAQ and the, uh, the New York Stock Exchange, but also pink sheets and various other techniques 
pipes and reverse, in, reverse entries and so forth. Those are very wild west markets. So I, I, I see a lot of similarity between that and the cryptocurrency markets. I'm, uh, I see it really as a, the beginning and not as a bubble. Um, I think the market infrastructure needs to mature. Um, there's a lot of uh, uncertainty about a lot of the uh, uh, market infrastructure, the liquidity of the tokens, um, the exchanges themselves, a lot of the tokens are not listed. So there's a lot of things that need to mature in order for it to you know, grow. Um, so I don't see it as a bubble. Um, I think it's impressive to see the numbers right now. If you compare it to the total amounts that are raised uh, in the crowdfunding space, it's really small. If you compare it to all the amounts that are raised in the regular markets, it's really peanuts. Um, so let's not get over our heads. Like $100 million is really nothing. It's really impressive because it's new and it's related to you know, this technology that's new. But I think it's really just the beginning, and we really need to, as a community, um, really work together to make it sound, to understand what the issue is, to work with regulators, to um, make it more safe and, and avoid you know, the pitfalls that it had gone through. So, so the Barclays Investment Bank, I work in the CTO office there, we're not actively exploring virtual currencies. What we are doing is having a, a watching brief, exploring what's progressing, similar to the watching position that many regulators had in the past as they were exploring and understanding more. There are some fundamental things that I think people haven't got their head around yet completely. So if somebody mentioned, this is the value of their company. Does that mean it's a stock value? Others would argue the token has nothing to do with the value of the company. It has utility in terms of, for example, buying a token to store data or to process data. Depending which of those two distinct categories, you would have different sets of regulation applied to them. So we have this umbrella term of ICO. Maybe there should be subcategories within it, and that would help us in order to apply the appropriate regulation. So that's one key thing, I think, is just understanding what is it being more precise so some of the terms in the DLT space over the last few years, people have been grappling with defining them and pinning them down accurately. Once you've done that, you can do a lot more with them formally. Before that, you're kind of at the edge and not quite sure what they are. So a topic we looked at was smart contracts. We spent a lot of time looking at what is a good definition of them. We came up with three sentences. It took us a long time to come up with that. Iterate via the legal processes within the bank with third party reviewers, including EM and trade associations, and so on. We actually came up finally with a version that's nice and succinct and made sense, and we could share with the regulators for our view of what we think it is and be public. I think it'd be great if a similar initiative could do something for ICOs so that not just the banks or the startups working in the space, but the regulators can have a framework to consider oh, this has this set of features, therefore we should regulate it in this way. Or maybe certain things don't need explicit supervision by a regulator. If, for example, there are tokens to do some element of crowd, um, cloud processing. So that, that would be my view. It's, we need to understand more before we can conclude our opinion. Can you really argue that um, an ICO is not connected to the value of a company when the proceeds of that ICO to a big proportion go towards funding the development of the product that the company will eventually launch? Uh, you could argue very much so and construct scenarios in which it is. You could construct ones in which it isn't. You could do pathological examples. You could do trickery around that as well. I think so that's what we need to do is to identify the features that clearly say, yes, it associates itself with a company, a registered company that has value. I think this touches on something that's really interesting in your presentation, actually, that you automatically have put in a governance model for your chain. And I think everybody is doing this now. Everybody that can see with Bitcoin that governance is very resistant to change. It's too resistant to change. It's very topical now. And so I think what's going to happen, which touches on what you're saying, is when people do ICOs, 
they're going to say, this is what we're building, this is the token, uh, we agree not to sell the token too quickly, damage the ether price, um, this is how the government works, uh, you can use your token to vote, uh, maybe there's different sorts of tokens, preferential tokens, which is just stealing from the share agreements, and I think very quickly people will do a lot stronger due diligence on these ICOs or whatever they become. I think actually that that Delaware proposal is going through that real companies you know, can have real shares on the blockchain, that's going to factor in. And I think there's going to be a hybrid model which you'll have whatever they're called, it won't be called an ICO, it'll be something else, and you'll have a very nice perspective and it will be legally checked and you'll have a nice governance model and it'll be a bit more formal but it'll still be a lot cheaper than doing IPO. The, the numbers are small, but the great thing about ICOs is they're very cheap to run. That's the main difference. I, I, I'm going to play this sort of conservative card. I think, um, so I think they're incredibly exciting, but at the same time, as far as I can tell, they're entirely unregulated. And, and regulation is there predominantly to protect uh, consumers uh, and, 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 and organizations as well, of course. Um, and, and in the case where an ICO has uh, sold what, in effect, has been described as an in-game token um, for use of a future platform where the platform hasn't been described yet and hasn't been built yet, that, that worries me because uh, the, the, the investors who are buying those tokens are taking an awful punt. And, and as far as I can tell, there is no recourse. There, there, isn't, there is no, 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 no obligation to provide a uh, formal prospectus or anything like that. And, and that's the aspect that, that I'm concerned about. Interesting enough, you called you call them investors, right? From what I'm seeing in the cryptocurrency space, it's not like there might be a part where people have a lot of money due to Ethereum, right? But from what I'm seeing, it's these people that looked at the price of Bitcoin and then didn't invest in Bitcoin because, and then now they felt left out. And then they looked at Ethereum and looked at the two ex, uh, the massive gains essentially that Ethereum made, and are now just like piling money into the ecosystem. So people that have no idea on any of the technology that can do any of the due diligence behind, is this a scam, is this not a scam? But they're using platforms like Coinbase, which does a great job at like getting fiat currency into the ecosystem, to just like pile into Ethereum and just invest into any random ICO because they are hoping for like those twenty X returns within a year. Yeah. So and like what you mentioned, like they're not investors, right? They're essentially they're not spec speculators that have no idea what they're doing. And, and considering the model of regulation and so forth, which is built up over a century without much challenge, it is quite a complicated model and has a lot of elements to it. Some of those elements might be due for revision. There might be new elements that come into play. Uh, what we are seeing now is this model of an ICO being compared to an IPO. So where's the prospectus? Where's the team? Where's the risk analysis? Where's this? Where's the filings? Where's that? A lot of these things are dropped away and things are still moving on. Things are still working. So there's a chance to, if you like, have a, a retrospective analysis of how we should raise funds and how far we should go. Um, we are in a new time and era. We have the internet, we have information moving much more quickly, we have the ability to govern things on a much more direct fashion. People who control these tokens have direct voting capabilities on the tokens, if such is provided. So a lot of the older ways that we did IPOs could be re-evaluated. Uh, re there is something new here and we should have a go at figuring out what that is, but it might take time to figure that out. Yeah, and given how of using the, the methods that you use for an IPO. Like, what are you going to disclose? Well, we have a, a reverse situation. To mm. Should well, we take a question? There's a question over here. <laughs> well, I just have a very strong yeah, opinion on this. So I just wanted to throw in there. So all of these tokens are subject to free market pricing. That's something that we cannot stop. The real question is, is do we push that completely to the secondary market or do we bring it to the primary market? I think we can all agree that these chains, you know, all exist. We can duplicate Ethereum 
10 times over. We can duplicate any chain that there is. The real value is in the network effects or the distribution of that token. So the question is, is do we leave the free market pricing entirely for the secondary market or do we bring it in to the actual primary sale or issuance of the tokens? So the reality is, is we can work backwards and say, hey, we want to raise this amount of money. And if we do that, we can do something like the BAT token and every, the miners can block everyone out and they can take all the tokens and initially immediately sell it for eight, ten times what they did. But that doesn't stop the token from trading at a $600 million valuation. But the way that it should be designed is actually focusing on the quality of the distribution. That's actually more important than the amount of money being raised because that is what networks are. And what I believe is that by extending, you know, proof of work introduced an incredible distribution mechanism, right, which is essentially infinite, a, a finite amount of coins distributed every single day versus amount of resources coming in, we divide that in, and that allows it to harmoniously transfer to a secondary market. So I think it really comes down to when you design an ICO, what are your objectives? Are you trying to design wide, broad distribution that's fair for everybody, or are you trying to raise a fixed amount? And I think that at this stage, everyone should be prioritizing the integrity of distribution, especially in proof of stake networks where it's so sensitive to, to, you know, where it is extremely sensitive. There's no way to distribute a proof of stake network in 30 seconds, let alone, or, or, or 30 days, right? Or cap the amount so that only 10 people get in and control the entire network. So I think what we really need to be thinking about is what makes proper distribution, what what is what, what kind of distribution adds value to the network that allows these things to super to, to, to become incumbents? Go through the top ten currencies that exist on coin market cap and ask yourself how many of these were distributed in a day. So let me um, pose this question. You have a very underprivileged family. They're struggling. The, the father may be an alcoholic, and he decides that uh, instead of going and buying a lottery ticket, he's going to take this month's money that he received from the government to pay for uh, his accommodation and children's food. And he puts it on an ICO because his mate told him that it's going to go to 24. And we have a lot of people doing that potentially because a lot of people are not as privileged as we are to uh, kind of put a lot of assets and gamble them away. And then what happens next is that um, that money is lost. And the wife gets beaten up because the guy is depressed. And then she goes to the government and says, my children have nowhere to stay. And the government will dole out and dish out more money to pay for it. That's what happens every day in this country and many other countries. And we will all sit around and we will say, oh my god, we never realized that because of this ICOs, where a bunch of developers get filthy rich, just like the bank is before them, and we get in a situation where wives are beaten up. How will we feel about that? And then talk about whether or not we need a regulation of free market. Oh, it's, it's the Spider-Man quote. With great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we do and we should do. Because ultimately we need to understand that there is a wider social responsibility. And I, I don't know if I have the answer to that, but there's a good reason why so much of the IPO system has been created. And ask yourself, are you going to be happy waking up one morning, having raised whatever it is, which you thought was real fun, 150 million, and a mother rate, uh, telling her, because of your IPO, she's got beaten up and the child is dead. Are you going to be happy with that? Your, your feelings are understood, but one doesn't follow from the other. If we get rid of the ICOs and the IPOs or whatever it is, there are a thousand ways in which the yes. father can go and waste the money. So you should be really analyzing what can we do about the father? Not how they waste the money, but the fact that they are wasting the money is an issue. And if you want, we can take this offline and I can tell you how to do this. Interesting enough. <laughs> Where does the original IPO legislation, for example, in the US, that you have to be an accredited investor and invest in an IPO come from? Like, why is that the place if this ICO model is so good that everyone can just invest random amounts of money? I can't possibly say because we are not accepting American investors. We are protecting them from this danger that Alex is in our life. we have a question from I think there's a few things to consider here. First, there is no investors, there's contributors. 
That's number one. Agreed. Going back to your USA issue. Second, we're redistributing the risk here, meaning that people that don't know what they're doing, with zero due diligence, are investing in something they think is going to make money. So we're trying to understand the question. So there's no investors that you said they're investing. So it's the well, they think they're investing, but when legally speaking in the contract, when you actually read the terms and conditions of every ICO I've read, we're talking about contribution mm -hmm. donation. or donation. Yeah. It's, it's so, to, um, so, so your opinion, maybe that. somebody right. writes the document, maybe that. But their lawyers, their lawyers pay top money to say that it's not an investment. Otherwise, they all go to jail because ultimately, someone's going to go to jail. So, so I'm not giving opinion on it. I'm just no, saying no. that it's useful. I'm just telling you, a lot of people are going to go to jail. I think. So we we at are the moment. The it's unregulated, so there is it's it's free for all. So everybody is taking their own risk. And, and the problem is, is when millions of people invest, and they and and they go to the government to say, "Wait well, a minute, what is this thing?" And they will have nowhere to hide. The lawyers will reverse and go back to the CEOs, and the CEO is going to go to jail. I think the key question we have to ask is, are people being rational or irrational? And when, when uh, a whole load of people pile into an ICO called Worthless Coin, and there isn't, there's nothing, there isn't even a white paper, I think we have to say they're being irrational. And that's what, they, they don't that have irrationality is what we've seen before. We, we may call it a bubble, we may not, but it is the South Sea bubble, the Tulip bubble, yeah. the internet boom, and, you know, the first internet boom, these were all largely irrational but, evaluations. But the case. difference here is VC, Angel, Seed, guys from Delaware were investing and they knew what they were doing. They knew they were investing X in 10 companies and one may make it. Today what we see is a pile of guys from everywhere putting their fiat money into a machine that is completely unregulated, which is what I'm trying to say. Is it's great for people that have been you know, in the space for a while and understand what's going on and can navigate the crap. But for the new guys, and I've seen a few, I am very worried. And I think CEOs are going to end up in jail. Yeah. That's an interesting Friend example, maybe. Yeah, okay. Um, so, Tom, so there was this Tom Slack conversation, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think a couple of, like a week ago, I think, um, where maybe if you're in the Slack communities of, of a lot of these companies, um, you have those, there was like massive scammy wave where there was like a fake my ether wallet going. Mm -hmm. yes. And like a lot of these people lost like thirty thousand dollars by clicking on a link and entering their secret words, like their secret phrases for the entire wallet. And they really have to ask, like, do these people understand what they're doing? And I think the answer is clearly not. So oh, yes, but now you're talking about click fraud and so forth. We've had this on the internet for the last twenty years. We've had phishing, and the internet has not solved this. The browsers have not solved this. This is not the ICO's problem. So, so interesting. We, we do a lot, a lot of things. So we do a lot of game theory about not cheating and whatever else. Why don't we apply the same game theory to figure out if the person who's sending the coin actually understands the principle of it? And I think there is a lot of work we can do where you simply won't be able to invest almost like a qualified investor scheme, but not based on how much cash you have. But actually, can you figure out what the hell the system does to make an informed decision? And I think there's a lot of opportunity here for us to start building it in. And it's a shame people are not focusing on because they're focusing on capturing value rather than protecting the people who invest in it. It's a great idea. But what happens when you let the lawyers loose on that idea? So, <laughs> adding on to this, I actually agree with you I entirely. Have no idea. Well, the Is that a question? <laughs> the guy in the pink shirt? Um, yeah. So, uh, I, I really get your point what you're, where you're coming from. But what if this ICO can fund? Uh, some sort of a project where a new Einstein comes to this world and solves the poverty. So it's a chicken and egg problem. It has both the sides. Whereas ICOs, which we are saying about right now, or ICOs are new thing, this whole Kickstarter thing is a pretty old thing. It goes back to Pebble. Pebble raised $20 million to fund a watch. And uh, there were other companies as well, which didn't deliver their goods. So should we shut down the entire Kickstarters? These companies are also coming with seed money and just promising big projects. So should we just shut down the innovation because we are worried about people? Or should we protect the people and uh, not care about the innovation? So it's a chicken and egg problem. So I want to hear more. So what would be the more ethical thing to do there? Yeah, right now, some of the ICOs are run under the Kickstarter regulation. 
population and these outsourcing regulations. So it's not like it's the Wild West, right? So I, I would be that worried about it. And by the way, you know, kind of one of the things we did on the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance was just to prove the token working group precisely talk through those issues. So do not misunderstand me when I say that there are issues. But I think my personal opinion, there are too many crypto guys who have this model of the world that's devoid from physical reality. I can always take a Facebook bat and bash your head in, and I don't care what it says on blockchain. Yep. So there are very real physical manifestations of this hypothetical ideas which sound great in theory when you're 21 and you have no kids and you're in a very safe, a safe environment. But consider the next time the oligarchic pumps 15 million into your ICO discovers it's fraud. What do you think is going to happen to your children? So just be aware of the very physical manifestation of life <laughs> and what seems funny right now ain't going to be so funny when your legs are broken. So from so, yeah. so just report, taking a step back, when it was on screen here, the title of the panel was Crypto Finance. Interesting, because that's a huge topic. Let's switch the words around. Finance, cryptography, financial cryptography. Well, long and distinguished history, cryptography, in finance, all these different components of it. Huge field. Lots of really interesting stuff. ICO, it's just the latest hot topic. It's just peaked, particularly in the last few months. There's a lot of really interesting stuff in this space. And it's interesting, you know, to gauge the temperature here. It's not just intellectual curiosity, it's real emotion from many of these people. And that's interesting. So if you did a sense check, a temperature check, say a year ago, people were talking about how do we make sure we get data privacy separate from so and so on a blockchain that doesn't you know, quite computer science oriented, and people weren't as emotionally passionate. No, we were. Well, we, were in the the, we were in the middle of the DAO last year, same time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah so I just want to, I just want to yeah. say one yeah. thing. First of all, I think this is the yeah, best discussion we've had all night. Yeah. The um, corporate descriptive. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think this is the best discussion we've had all night, and I completely agree that we need regulation in this space more than anything. Um, I agree that we need smart regulation, and that's what's difficult. What is smart regulation? I think the entire conversation that we're having right now is not relevant to ICOs, because the vast majority of investment going to the space is not going into ICOs, it's going into mining. And mining is a pure investment into the network. And we're investing $5 billion a year in the top networks. So it's not really about whether it's this ICO or that ICO. People are hauling tons of money into things that they don't understand. And I think we absolutely do need regulation. But I think that the ICOs are the vast minority of this entire subject matter. Well, do we have a question at the back? No, I guess the ruler and then maybe this. Uh, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. We have all there. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, you, you go ahead, sorry. Okay. In uh, 2004, the regulator interpreted it originally as an, as an IPO because the media coverage included Bitcoin addresses and people said, fantastic, we support you, and uh, we send Bitcoin to your addresses. Do you still have a question? I do. Yeah? <laughs> well, it's an observation. Interesting that, um, the, that the more prudent uh, section of the panel, so Alex, these guys are not involved in any ICOs. However, the, uh, the, 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 the guys that are involved in ICOs are, are incredibly positive about them. Why might that be? Oh, hang on a minute. You guys have raised hundreds of millions of dollars, right? Of course you're going to be positive. Uh, but, but then, but then uh, okay, so um, perhaps not consensus. Um, so the, the, the thing, the thing that worries me, uh, oh, the thing that worries the me, original, please. Yeah, uh, come on. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you guys are the original. <laughs> consensus. <laughs> um, and the thing that really worries me, I, I used to, I used to audit investment banks, right? And I used to spend a hell of a lot of time checking to see that um, everything, everything was done by the book, right? But and, and, and we, we would do this every year uh, to, to check that, 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 that everything, uh, checks and balances, that everything, everything was good. Just all the shareholders, right? And you have to do this on a, on, a, on a yearly basis. You have to do it every year, right? You know, for, for, 
that uh, you guys or, or the guys that have raised money through an ICO, there's absolutely zero, zero accountability going forward. So uh, I would just like to point out that we are in discussions with a uh, top four auditor to come in and audit our books. But It'll be announced this week. At the moment, right? at, at, as of this moment, yes, we are running on trust. But we're just about to... Everyone's uh, participation was elective. Yeah, of course, right? But the thing is, yes, elective. but come on. You, you, you say that, but look at the investment bank. I'm from an investment bank. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know it's different. I know it's different. Some are free to rock it at the moment. And the others, you know, are 300 years old. I won't name anyone. But, you know, British bank. <laughs> and I work there. And suddenly they had a little problem with a few scandals. With this. So, so I think it will... But it depends what, 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 what kind of level we're talking about. So... I think the question about the innovation was really, really interesting. The question about where the money is going and the, the sheer size of what ICO represents versus other things that we potentially not even focusing on, we don't even see. That's really interesting. Well, mining is the investment. Yeah. That's the real, what, the 95% to, to have numbers on that. because Five billion a, a year. Of, Five yeah. billion a year between so, just the top two networks. <laughs> that's the real investment. Are those people informed? When Ethereum drops 50% a week, which it just did, all right. How, why aren't we talking about those guys? Because that's the real money. The ICOs represent nothing. But and I was talking a little that? bit about when you were talking about, you know, selling too quickly and stuff. Well, those ICOs are what gave Ether, Ether the value in the yes. first place. You got to buy Ether to buy in. Yeah, so normal. why 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 you should you why should anyone yeah, so, receive money? So let's bring it back to the yeah. panel no, no. topic because we're getting we getting quite emotional about ICOs. I was supposed to, but, yeah, but the regulation so the, is, is important. Yeah, but the topic discussion was. Are, is crypto finance and sort of the old finance, are they converging? So if, let's talk about that because I think they are because I think crypto is, because of Bitcoin and it's just gone on and on and on and every year it gets bigger and Ethereum is more potent than ever and there's teams everywhere. 100 billion is nothing. Okay, so 100 billion in 2017. I, yeah, but I tell you, I, I and a friend, we wrote one of the Bitcoin wallets, right? multi bit was, and our bill of materials over five years was two thousand pounds. Right, so that was over two thousand eleven, two thousand sixteen. Now we're talking in five years, we're going from thousands of pounds to hundreds of billions. Next year, by the end of next year, I I, I would bet money, except I'm not going to. So I bet it'd be a trillion September. trillion dollars. I, you know, by the end of twenty eighteen, there'll be another norm. I don't think it's. That no, happening. it's the control, uh, the control and the no, availability. I, I think it's the technology and what it does to um, how the banks use it in the trading and settlements, in the But it's, it's not the banks using it, though. It's or these, it's, it, it's yeah, these yeah, guys. It's it's enough on the point of technology. So looking at Ethereum, what is Ethereum currently used for? 99% of all Ethereum traffic is to raise money by ICOs. Correct. Like, which, which are no doing, case. which are finishing Correct. Theory, which are finishing so exactly. Theory. So, so yes. the ICO is highly so you bring the yes. demand. Yes. Yes. So, just going back to your point, which is traditional finance and crypto, and are they merging? I, I would ignore a lot of the ICO stuff and virtual currencies. It's not directly relevant to investment banking challenges, but the two topics are, and you can combine them and get. A lot of synergy. So if I look at the things we were looking at a couple of years ago, it was, are there any techniques in cryptography that can be applied to existing financial problems in order to help simplify what we're doing? And indeed there are. There are techniques that should have been applied years ago to help in various ways. If you look at how to secure data over time to make it, quote, immutable. So the various um, laws of SEC and so on applying to certain trades where you need a physical worm drive representation. It could be the case that a software implementation could achieve the same result. Totally independent of ICOs is good architecture software engineering. That's one of many examples you can build up to merge these two concepts of crypto and finance together. Lots of different topics in finance, a few core cool ones in crypto. And it's how to pick the different aspects in finance and which bits to merge together to make something that makes sense. ICOs are just one tiny bit of it that 
isn't really something a business use case challenge that we have at the moment in investment banking, but there are many other ones. And I think the whole point of smart contracts, distributed ledgers, offer some potential there. And you need cryptography to make some of that happen. And remember, the crypto stuff isn't magic sauce. That a lot of, um, if you look at crypto in finance, is how to secure messages, <laughs> transactions between each other. You know, very traditional technology. And it's taking that one or two steps further. So it's doing more than just encrypting the messages. So I, I think that's really exciting from an architecture perspective. And it, it's not a heated debate. It's more. A, Hey guys, we need to get on and build more of this stuff, make it fit for mm -hmm. purpose. But you need, to, you need to absorb some of that technology, and indeed, yeah. you could even absorb the concept of ICOs into this effect. Mm -hmm. but, but, but I think to ignore the fact that, that requires some thinking. <laughs> <laughs> but, but let's have a look at the origins of Bitcoin and most of it. It was the fundamental loss of trust in centralized systems post 2008 that enabled Bitcoin. So to say that there is no emotion in this is right, because if we trusted a single source, one big IBM mainframe, to calculate everything for us, you wouldn't have blockchain. It is a fundamental mistrust uh, that is at the core of the existing banking system that has drove, driven us to distribution, because basically we just don't trust the guys in buildings like this anymore. And then I think blockchain starts to solve that, because it basically says, I no longer have to trust a single individual. But I think there is a second fundamental problem, which is to protect the investors that we're not solving, we should be. And ICO is democratizing investment. But as much as the brain power has been um, expanded to, in some cases, sucker people into investing to this new alternative round, we as an industry should do better than the people we're trying to replace and actually start thinking equally hard how to not take money unless it's the right kind of money. And I think we can solve for that, but no one's bothering to look at that. Oh, they are though. Side. Like the woman on the counter, the, the sofa over there, it's Marilyn, her name is. And she's doing a thesis at the moment about decision making in dams. So people, that's her thesis subject, she'll be working on it when she's not here. So people are looking at it. Not, excuse me, the boring traditional people. But the new people coming on, and I just wanted to, to say, uh, I'll touch on these points. No, we're not boring. Yeah, yeah. It's just yeah. Yeah. Like you, there are so few people who know about this. I work on a project. It's ninety percent business people. The, the nerds really have to push hard to explain things. I, I so if you're in the audience and you're here, you're well ahead. Of I have a everyone. solution for the exact same problem, and I've worked it out. Uh, creating a whitelist thing on top of ERC20 token and putting the IDs. So you do a AML KYC, generate the listing, and that's how you can tackle the problem. This should be soon be out. But how do you decide whether or not, who makes the decision whether or not you are whitelisted? Uh, we use third party AML KYC company. So I can't go and look into the people's bank account because they won't get But if you're a terrorist organization or something, then you won't be able to participate in my ICO. And but each and every problem. That's not really the problem we're trying to solve. It just I mean, moves to the secondary market. How do you stop people from even paying Even in the secondary market, you can't, because your name has to be on the whitelist. Only then you can Oh, that's it. the old system. Yeah. Uh, so you, for instance, any well, single exchange can put that. That doesn't whitelist. change politics and diplomacy and things like that. You look at the Qatar government and the shit they in at the moment. The fact that they bought Paris Saint Germain, yeah, just number one, it's like, so who is right, who is wrong here? So it goes even beyond that. But I think going back to what Alex was saying, I, I, I do agree in a way what you're saying, but it's the a, implementation it's a, of it's a how you whitelist yeah, it's a, is yeah. very difficult it's because the banks have this problem every day. It's Me. a start of an innovation which is going in some direction, and then you can have voting consensus in the community, so community can vote bad apples out themselves, who they want to associate themselves in. So it's a starting point. Yeah, the yeah, but judge that's is a bad that's apple, starting right? point yeah. takes us into a very difficult direction. You are saying that you're going to put in place KYC and AML to stop the terrorist, yeah. but you yeah. end up getting mixed up and poor Alex's father gets flagged so the mother can't open a bank John, account, John. <laughs> cannot trade, and cannot yeah, that's North Korea. be Seven part of society. Half. Let's put and a you face now, to John. Yeah, he's our <laughs> You now 
putting in place social policy on finance. And, and because we've spent the last millennia or prior to that living on the notion of cash as the way we control finance, you're now entering into a new era of centralized control of social policy. Are you ready for that? Because it's not a comfortable future. I think, you know, one of the things that I thought I observed with the Dow was, uh, you know, I was upset when the Dow happened because, because, you uh, lost money? <laughs> <laughs> no, Nobody lost money. Come on. I'm, I'm betting money. I'm betting money. Shorted. <laughs> I'm if you're in the group of the five pools, you, you don't invest money as well. But, <laughs> but, um, but, but it was that everyone, I can't sure. remember what the amount was, 145, 150 million, something like that. It, it was too big, too fast. And, and, you know, everyone went in thinking the code was law, and everyone came out realizing, shit, I got screwed. And, um, and it... And if it had just been a bit smaller, then I think the, the, the environment, the context, the law, the, the way people think about regulation and, and controls could have evolved. So, and, and I feel it's the same with, um, you know, with ICOs at the moment. They, they've just grown too big too fast. If, if we had a little bit more slow progression where, you know, the amounts being raised by each organization were were more reasonable, and, and more reasonable compared to what they've already built, for example, and, and what they can show they've done, and what their roadmap is, then then it would, we could look at regulating them in a more efficient way, so so not in the same old way that uh, IPOs are regulated, but we could we could get there over a period of years, because we just can't get there in six months or two months. Or more. So here's an idea. If we followed the Lloyd's Names market, where we say basically if you invest, there's unlimited liability. So anyone who invests in IPO now signs up to unlimited liability. So that if it turns out that people who shouldn't have invested do invest in it, then there's a class action lawsuit and everybody who's participated can potentially have to recoup the social uh, kind of impact on this. How many of us would actually invest in an ICO? We do, we do with the banks. I mean, the problem pays for the failures. Absolutely. And I think what we need to do is build better than what we had before rather than replicate it. It's not going to happen. Better they write the law. It's not going to happen. At the moment, it's, uh, yeah. well, it's an interesting point. So I, well, generally, in terms of how, how, do you regulate, how will you regulate ICOs? So, what can one government do to actually regulate an ICO, right? So, currently, 99% of the ICOs are run around Switzerland as a set of a foundation that finds some other company that's actually incorporated someone else, right? And there are usually three people on the board of the Swiss foundation, which is one guy that, uh, that sets up all the foundations and then two other founders company. So, but if, so let's say Switzerland uses new regulation that's now blocks this, where will we move next and how will we prevent this money moving into ICOs? So is it even possible to regulate this? I'm not even sure what it means for an ICO to be in a country. Yeah. I don't understand that concept. Okay, we take a last question and then maybe go for a pop to <laughs> this is not. <laughs> yeah. well, who wanna, who yeah, are? Just to change, uh, it's, uh, it's not on the topic, but since uh, the, fan, the panel is, is there, yeah, for, from an outsider perspective, it looks like you have different protocol uh, being implemented, trying to compete for the same thing. Some people go B2C, B2B, but and very often, blockchain is the analogy is the early days of the internet, but the internet was open and there's just one now. There's not two or three internet really. I mean, the, the few in internet that are left are not, I'm not sure about it. But we, so the question is, and I'm sorry it's not related to the, 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 the subject, but is um, are these different protocols not trying to achieve the same thing? And yes. where, whether you see where you, you see them co converging into uh, or, 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 or just trying to compete for the super, no, one supremacy. Just, just to clarify the question, so you're saying once upon a time there were different intranets, but now there's only the internet. It's not the case. No, no, I'm saying within corporations, they have intranets that yeah. covers many, many of the mm. functionalities that they do. There are walled gardens, and that's how large corporations operate. But they all they connect as well to the external internet for certain features. Some of that can be blocked by banks. The bulk of what you do 
expense report, you name it, is performed on an intract net. Mm. So let's take that model and think what would occur but in a corporate common, banking world. But it's a yeah. common protocol. Yeah, yeah, that's yes. the same. Yeah. So, well, because yeah, yeah. TCPIP. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, that's the, put the layer of protocol I'm talking about the TCPIP, which is something universal shared by even the internet. So, well, but there the, are companies in the blockchain space who work with this kind of interoperability, yeah. right? And I did talk about it. Like, ten, like, we are probably not going to move to a model where there's one blockchain to rule them all because there's never going to be this sort of development team that is able to build for every single niche use case. We will end up in a model where it looks very much like the internet today, where companies run their own blockchains and connects to a central backbone blockchain, essentially. So who's that going to be? So, so my it's concern is, okay. is the challenge of that happening. <laughs> I think it's probably the hardest intellectual challenge that exists in the distributed ledger space. Mm -hmm. People talk about, oh, this will interoperate with that. If you actually run through the details and you think, what does it take for an encumbered asset that securities financing, you can perform net and encumbrance, and you look at real world capital markets, it's incredibly complicated. And the way you often solve it is to delegate to a market infrastructure firm who freezes time, and perform these actions, you often have to pre fund stuff, a whole load of things. So the more you know about capital markets, the more you realize the throwaway comment of they'll just operate, interoperate. It's, it's really, really difficult. And I, I haven't yet seen a viable initiative going forward that looks like it's going to solve the well, capital markets for interoperability. It's already started there. I mean, oh, 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 honestly, I, I went to the uh, members' conference in New York and I had a presentation, so I had three members' conference in New York, and I had a deck about interoperability between fabric and. Uh, What's the fabric? Yeah, on the flight, I down, I cloned the code to do it and ran it, and it's very nice. It's like interrupt 0.1, and, and that's been that's been donated back. But, but that was just what we were talking about. Was there, was, was there a control of was there a control of blockchain and uh, sub control of distributed? Like yeah, so you got you got your blockchain, you got a listener, and then you got hub. But that So I was giving an illustration. Let me just conclude. It's already started, are, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, oh, indeed. And what I'm saying is these are almost baby steps to achieve full interoperability with the, what happens in capital markets between radically different platforms with different models and encumbrances in a decentralized manner, I think is exceptionally difficult. I agree. If you just assume mm -hmm. traditional technologies and to do that, the solution is to centralize and do things. Guys, I think it's a really great time to move to the pub. Isn't it? <laughs> 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 it's a coming <laughs> break. So, That's the best pub. Yeah, to, uh, <laughs> so, first of all, <laughs>